The Coming Sunday Law. This is number two in this series. First, let us pray. Dear God, our Father, as we open the Holy Word and listen to the counsel given by thy last day prophet, open our hearts that we may be prepared to understand and be ready for the coming crisis. And we ask this in the name of the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Turning to the scripture, we read in Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. What divine assurance. May this message I bring to you in this tape bring you courage to face the future. Let us begin our study with a visit to the plain of Dura in old Babylon in the time when King Nebuchadnezzar ruled this mighty world kingdom. God had graciously given this king a dream by revealing the history of the world from his day to the very end of time. But old King Nebuchadnezzar determined to forget this dream, that Babylon would come to an end and be followed by other kingdoms, and instead the king with his counselors determined to misrepresent the truth of this dream by producing an imposing statue somewhat similar to what God had revealed. We read in Daniel 2 about this image of a man whose head was of gold, the chest of silver, the belly and thigh of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron mixed with clay, representing the deterioration of the coming earthly kingdoms. But Nebuchadnezzar's image would be of solid gold from head to toes, approximately 100 feet in height, representing his kingdom that was to last forever. It was so beautiful and so priceless that the king would demand all to worship this golden image, which he had planned to permanently implant into the state religion of Babylon. Thus, we see Satan working through this king, seeking to thwart the divine purpose of God for the human race of this world. When the day of dedication finally arrived for this idol, a vast concourse from all people, nations, and languages assembled around this great image on the plain of Dura. And when the music sounded at the king's command, the entire assembly fell down and worshipped the golden image. No. You see, there were three men. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three Sabbath keepers who were the worshipers of the only true God enthroned in the heaven above. Now these jealous wise men quickly brought word to the king 
that three men had dared to disobey his command. When these three men were brought before the king, he inquired, Do not you, do not ye serve my God, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Then pointing to that fiery furnace, he threatened them with death if they would not unite with the multitude and worship his idol god. But the king also recognized that these three wise men had been his most trusted subjects and that they had faithfully performed every assigned duty. So he determined that he would give them another trial. If they would not unite with the multitude in worship of the image he had set up, then he defiantly cried, Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? These three men facing the fiery furnace replied, and I am reading from Prophets and Kings, page 508, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, if this is your decision, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Can you imagine the faith born of obedience that these three Hebrews exhibited? I continue. Their faith strengthened as they declared that God would be glorified by delivering them, and with triumphant assurance, born of implicit trust in God, they added, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Unquote. At these stirring words, the king's wrath knew no bounds. He commanded the furnace to be heated seven times hotter. Reading on, as God's witnesses were cast into the furnace, the Savior revealed himself to them in person, and together they walked in the midst of the fire. In the presence of the Lord of heat and cold, the flames lost their power to consume. Oh, what a God we trust in. Praise his name. Then the king arose from his royal seat, expecting to see these three men utterly destroyed. But suddenly his face grew pale, for as he stares into the glowing furnace, he cries, and I am reading again from page 509, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the fourth, the form of the fourth, is like the Son of God. Now the king forgets his dignity. He goes up to the very entrance of the furnace, and he cries aloud, Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come forth, untouched by the flames. Not even a hair of their head had been singed. Just here we discover the very important lesson to be found in this presentation. I am reading from Prophets and Kings, page 512. In this our day. Now you will notice this is the time in which we are living. Let me read it now. In this our day, many of God's servants, though innocent of wrongdoing, will be given over to suffering humiliation and abuse at the hands of those 
who, inspired by Satan, are filled with envy and religious bigotry. Especially will the wrath of man be aroused against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. And at last, a universal decree will denounce these as deserving of death." Unquote. Thus, we find our subject open before us. For the soon coming Sunday law is going to bring trouble upon us. Let us begin by discussing the importance of this event. We will find that it will be the signal that will jumpstart a whole list of other crucial events leading to the grand climax of Christ's coming to deliver his saints from certain death. So now, let us look at some very important quotations. I'm reading this one from The Last Day Events, page 128. Sooner or later, Sunday laws will be passed." Unquote. Now, if that were written today, I'm positive that it would read sooner. And believe me, as we progress in this study, it will be sooner than many of us think. For God has graciously given us every detail. First, this Sunday law will take place by a national act, not by some state law here and there throughout the nation. I am reading from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 410. Our land is in jeopardy. The time is drawing on when its legislatures shall so abjure the principles of Protestantism as to give countenance to Romanish apostasy. The people for whom God has so mar marvelously wrought, strengthening them to throw off the galling yoke of popery, will, by a national act, give vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome, and thus arouse the tyranny which only waits for a touch to start again into cruelty and despotism. What dramatic words! Second, the enforcement of this Sunday law will be mandatory because it is the law of the nation. I'm reading this from Bible Commentary 7, page 985. A more decided effort will be made to exalt the false Sabbath and to cast contempt upon God himself by supplanting the day he has blessed and sanctified. This false Sabbath is to be enforced by an oppressive law." Unquote. Number three, the clergy Notice, the clergy will endeavor to make the Sunday law a religious amendment to the Constitution. Did you know that? God has given us pictures here of what is soon to come. I'm reading Review and Herald, December 24, 1889. Quote, If the people can be led to favor a Sunday law, then the clergy, intent to exert their united influence to obtain a religious amendment to the Constitution and compel the nation to keep Sunday. Did you notice there that it tells us that the clergy will be united this can only mean the result of the ecumenical movement that is now in progress, 
which our church leaders are promoting the members to accept and follow. Next, let us consider what are the hidden objectives of this national Sunday law. The most important is first. Number one, it will be to destroy religious freedom in America. I am reading from Evangelism, page 236. The law of God through the agency of Satan is to be made void. In our land of boasted freedom, religious liberty will come to an end." Unquote. What a tragedy when this happens. I believe you will agree with me that it will be time to dismantle the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor which has been given to us by France to honor a nation who would dare to make it possible for man to worship his God as his conscience led him. Second, this Sunday law will make it possible for papal Rome to force the conscience just as it did in the Dark Ages. I am reading now from Maranatha, page 179. Protestants will throw their whole influence and strength on the side of papacy by a national act enforcing the false Sabbath. They will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome reviving her tyranny and oppression of conscience." Unquote. Then, number three, this law will crush the spirit of freedom in America forever. Something that has not been experienced for the past 200 years. I am reading from the last day events. <clears throat> Page 144, a great crisis awaits the people of God. Very soon, our nation will accept, will attempt to enforce upon all the observance of the first day of the week as a sacred day, unquote. You know what that means? Business will stop. Religious liberty will end. Sabbath keepers will suddenly find themselves opposed, hated, and thrust into a battle for their very life. Manuscript Revel Release Number 4, 278. Soon the Sunday laws will be enforced, and men in position of trust will be embittered against the little handful of God's commandment-keeping people. From Last Day Events, page 144, are these words, Seventh-day Adventists will fight the battle over the Seventh-day Sabbath. There's not going to be any fence-sitting, no standing by idly, do nothing, attitude, everyone will fight a battle for his very life. The enactment of this Sunday law will produce three important steps in the fulfillment of that great prophecy found in Revelation 13, 11 to 16. Let's read it. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, 
whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Now notice how the great controversy points out these three steps, namely, one, to a worship of the papacy, two, making an image to the beast, three, and then the placement of the mark of the beast. I want to read this from Great Controversy 578. The prophecy of Revelation 13 declares that the power represented by the beast with the lamb-like horns shall cause the earth and them which dwell therein, number one, to worship the papacy. They're symbolized by the beast like unto a leopard. The beast with the two horns is also to say to them that dwell on the earth, this is number two, that they should make an image to the beast. And furthermore, it is to command all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, here comes number three, to receive the mark of the beast. It has been shown that the United States is the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns, and that this prophecy will be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance." Unquote. Now let us explore each of these three in detail. First, let's take those words to worship the papacy. In Testimonies, Volume 5, page 525, the decree shall go forth requiring all to worship the beast and his image. Now this can be nothing more than force. Force is to be used symbolizing a police state. Great Controversy, page 578. The beast with the lamb-like horns shall cause the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the papacy. And believe me, America is fast preparing to become, to become a police state. For consider what has been planned. Congress has already voted millions for a hundred thousand extra police. And foreign troops are now stationed on American soil to be used, if necessary, to force its people to obey the will of the government. And I have heard recently of millions of smart cards which are now being produced this year. And detention camps stand ready. Did you know that by the stroke of a president's pen the following can be implemented, implemented for reasons such as international 
tension, internal unrest, or financial crisis. Now, what am I talking about? The following can immediately take place by the stroke of the President of the United States. Executive Order 10995, which will take over all communications. Executive Order 10997 takes over all electric power, petroleum, gas, fuel, and minerals. Executive Order 10998 takes over all food resources and every farm. Executive Order 10999 takes over all means of transportation, controlling all highways and seaports. Executive Order 11000 drafts all citizens into workforces under government supervision. Executive Order 11001 takes over all health and welfare and educational functions. Executive Order 11002 empowers the Postmaster General to register every citizen nationwide. Executive Order 11003 takes over all airports and aircraft. Executive Order 11004 takes over housing and finance authorities, designating areas to be abandoned as unsafe, establishing new locations for populations and relocation of communities. Executive Order 11005 takes over all railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. Executive Order 11051 designates responsibilities of the Office of Emergency Planning, gives authority to put the above orders into effect in times of increased international tension or economic or financial crisis, unquote. There it is. For under President Nixon, these orders were combined into Executive Order 11490. And President Carter added a few minor amendments on July 20, 1979. And all of them can be opposed upon us in a moment, any time there is in the President's opinion international tension, internal unrest, or financial crisis. Just ask your congressman if there's any question in your mind. Thus, the possibility of the image of the beast becomes manifest. In Review and Herald, December 11, 1888, we are told, and I quote, a great crisis of God. Very soon our nation will attempt to enforce upon all the observance of the first day of the week as a sacred day. In doing this, they will not scruple to compel men against the voice of their own conscience to observe the day the nation declares to be the Sabbath." Unquote. And don't forget, with the worship enforced by the image of the beast comes also the mark of the beast. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 213. The decree has been passed by the highest earthly authority that they shall worship the beast and receive his mark under the pain of persecution and death. 
May God help his people now. For what can they then do in such a fearful conflict without his assistance? Unquote. And so you see, this Sunday law will bring God's final test to mankind. Great Controversy, page 604. With the issue thus clearly brought before him, whoever shall trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. He accepts the sign of allegiance to the power which he chooses to obey instead of God. The warning from heaven is, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Unquote. So it is very clear, no one will receive the mark until he understands the issue that will take place in this Sunday law and personally chooses to obey the Sunday law. Now this great controversy is going to divide everyone into two groups. Those who are to receive the mark of the beast and those who are to receive the seal of the living God. Every nation on earth is going to follow the United States in making a Sunday law which is a part of this new world order. I read in Revelation 17, 13, speaking of these nations, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Then in Selected Messages, page 392, we find this phrase, these have one mind, explained as to exactly who they are. Listen as I read. These have one mind. There will be a universal bond of union, one great harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Thus is manifest the same arbitrary, oppressive power against religious liberty, freedom to worship God, <clears throat> according to the dictates of conscience, as was manifested by the papacy, when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. So, we can now make these statements, each backed by inspiration. One, a Sunday-keeping decree will be forced upon the world. Bible Commentary 7, page 976. The decree enforcing the worship of this day is to go forth to all the world. Unquote. Two, all the world will accept and will participate. Volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 352. The Sabbath question is to be the issue of the great final conflict in which all the world will act a part. Number three, foreign nations will accept this Sunday law. Volume 6, page 395. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though, though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come to our people in all parts of the world. Number four, all nations will obey. Maranatha, page 214. All nations and tongues 
and peoples will be commanded to worship this spurious Sabbath. This is Satan's plan to make of no account the day instituted by God and given to the world as a memorial of creation. The decree enforcing the worship of this day is to go forth to all the world, unquote. So now, let's continue and dig a little deeper. I'm referring to the no buying and selling provision found in Revelation 13, 16, and 17. And he commanded all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now here comes a question. Is this the same as the National Sunday Law, or is it some separate decree or law? We have not been told much about this. I have searched greatly for it. It could be the follow-up legislation. However, the penalties of the original Sunday law are so strong that all but a few will yield to keep Sunday sacred and receive the mark of the beast. For we are told that the threat of imprisonment and death are included in the Sunday law. And such is even stronger that the no buy nor sell without the mark. But now let's look at some other information and details which are very amazing. First, all assets will be worthless. In the last day events, page 148, hoarded wealth will soon be worthless. When the decree shall go forth that none shall buy or sell, except they have the mark of the beast, very much means will be of no avail. This, you see, this no buy or sell restriction will apply only to commandment keepers. In Councils on Stewardship, page 40, I read, There is a time coming when commandment keepers can neither buy nor sell. Make haste to dig out your buried talents. If God has entrusted you with money, show yourselves faithful to your trust. Unwrap your napkin and send your talents to the exchangers that when Christ shall come, he may receive his own with interest." Unquote. The faithful will be penalized for refusing to break God's commandments. You find this in Desire of Ages, page 121 to 122. In the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers. They will be forbidden to buy or sell. It will finally be decreed that they shall be put to death. See Revelation 13, 11 to 17. But then comes this promise. But to the obedient is given the promise. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. Praise God, he's going to take care of his own. I continue to read. By this promise, the children of God will live. When the earth shall be wasted with famine, they shall be fed. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. Psalms 37, 19. 
what more could we ask of God? And this buy or sell law will be worldwide, for the entire world will be under a new world order of the papacy. In Patri Prophets and Kings, page 183, Satan says, now notice how he plans to achieve this, Satan says, for fear of wanting food and clothing, they will join with the world in transgressing God's law. The earth will be wholly under my dominion, unquote. This is what Satan says. Now this brings us back to my opening remarks. Manuscript release 91, 1896, quote, As Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, issued a decree that all who would not bow down and worship this image should be killed, so a proclamation will be made that all who will not reverence that Sunday institution will be punished with imprisonment and death. Let us read carefully the 13th chapter of Revelation, for it concerns every human agent, great and small." Unquote. Now with such admonition, which we have just read, we should not overlook one other warning given to us by inspiration, and that is this. We should make every effort now, while it is possible, to leave the large cities and move to the country or to a very small city. In Selected Messages 2, page 142, we read, Educate our people to get out of the cities, into the country, where they can obtain a small piece of land and make a home for themselves and their children. Ere long, there will be such strife and confusion in the cities that those who wish to leave them will not be able. We must be preparing for these issues." Unquote. Again and again, we read these urgent words, Selected Messages 2, page 352, Get out of the cities as soon as possible. And then there is this special warning found in volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 464. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of the nations in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in selected, in secluded places among the mountains. But with this, we should not overlook this counsel found in Selected Messages 2, page 359. If in the providence of God we can secure places away from the cities and the Lord would have us do this, there are troublous times before us. I see the necessity of making haste to get all things ready for the crisis." Unquote. We have also been instructed that unions will have a definite part in this final conflict. Therefore, we are to have nothing to do with them. Number one, we are not to unite with them. Selected Messages, 1, page 144. Those who claim to be the children of God are in no case to bind up with the labor unions that are formed or that shall be formed. This the Lord forbids. Cannot those who study the prophecies see and understand what is before us? Number two, membership in the unions 
will wrap us in the fold of the enemy. I am reading Selected Messages 2, page 142. The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future, which will soon come upon them with blinding force. In the world, gigantic monopolies will be formed. I must break in here. You hear of this every day in the news. Brothers and sisters, we are in the very end of time. I read again. In the world, gigantic monopolies will be formed. Men will bind themselves together in unions that will wrap them in the fold of the enemy. A few men will combine to grasp all the means to be obtained in certain lines of business. Trade unions will be formed, and those who refuse to join those unions will be marked men. Number three, and don't for overlook the unforgettable statement of the most terrible violence yet to come. I am reading letter 99, 1904, page 3. There is a great work before us. The enemy has succeeded in occupying the minds of those who believe the truth for this time. And hindrance after hindrance has been placed in the way of the advancement of God's work. It will be more difficult in the future than it is today. Satanic agencies are becoming more determined in the rebellion against God. The trade unions will be the cause of the most terrible violence that has ever been seen among human beings." Unquote. What could be more clearly stated than this? There can be no misunderstanding. In summary, let me state, when the substitute of the false for the true shall become universal, it will be time for God to act. Bible Commentary 7, page 980. The substitution of the laws of men for the laws of God, the exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. He will arise in his majesty to shake terribly the earth." Unquote. And finally, what has made this final rejection of God possible? Remember, it all started with the great false revival which we discussed in the first of this series. Selected Messages 3, page 427. Speaking of this false revival, we read, quote, The wicked declare that they had the truth, that miracles were among them, that angels from heaven talked with them and walked with them. I must break in here again. In our next study, The Wonder-Working Power of Satan, we will be surprised to hear that even devils will preach from Adventist pulpits. Let me read this again. The wicked declare that they had the truth, that miracles were wrought among them, that angels from heaven talked with them and walked with them, that great power and signs and wonders were performed among them, and that this was the great temporal millennium that they had been expecting so long. The whole world was converted and in harmony with the Sunday law. This is the result of the great false revival. And so this leads us to a worldwide worship of the Antichrist. And Satan is behind it all. Testimonies to Ministers, page 62. In this age, <clears throat> 
Antichrist will appear as the true Christ, and then the law of God will be fully made void in the nations of the world. Rebellion against God's holy law will be fully ripe, but the true leader of all this rebellion is Satan, clothed as an angel of light. Men will be deceived and will exalt him to the place of God and deify him. But omnipotence will interpose, and to the apostate churches that unite in the exaltation of Satan, the sentence will go forth, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord who judgeth her. Now as you have listened to this stirring message, I am sure I can hear someone say, Brother Nelson, you have filled my heart with fear. I am afraid of what is to come. To such a one, my dear brother or sister, I would say, let us not fear, but rather look up for our redemption draweth nigh. Remember Luke 21, 28, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. The coming of Christ is nearer than when we first believed. The great controversy is nearing its end. The judgments of God are in the land. They speak in solemn warning, saying, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. We are living in the closing scenes of this earth's history. Prophecy is fast fulfilling. The hours of probation are fast passing. We have no time, not a moment, to lose. Let us not be found sleeping on guard. Let no one say in his heart or by his works, my Lord, delayeth his coming. Let the message of Christ soon return, sound forth in earnest words of warning. Let us persuade men and women everywhere to repent and flee from the wrath to come. We are not to be sad, but cheerful, and we are to keep the Lord ever before us. He is soon coming. And we must be ready and waiting for his appearing. Oh, how glorious it will be to see him and be welcomed to his redeemed ones. Long have we waited, but our hope is not to grow dim. If we can but see the king in his beauty, we shall be forever blessed. I feel as if I must cry aloud, homeward bound. We are nearing the time when Christ will come in power and great glory to take his ransomed ones to the eternal home. Long have we waited for our Savior's return, but nonetheless sure is the promise, soon we shall be in our promised home. There Jesus will lead us beside the living waters flowing from the throne of God and will explain to us the dark provinces through which on this earth he brought us in order to perfect our characters. There we shall behold with undimmed vision the beauties of Eden restored, casting at his feet the crowns that he has placed on our heads and touching our golden harps. We shall fill all heaven with praise to him that sitteth on the throne. Volume 8, page 252. Thank you, God, for such encouragement. O oh, loving Father, may we ever keep our eyes on this glorious hope of a soon coming Savior and help us never to forget we are heaven bound.
as God keeps the night watch for you and for me. So sleep, sleep in peace and rest. No God's keeping the night watch for you and for me. Dreams you have cherished are all broken down. Hearts dearest treasures have all been. But when